Hello there folks. This video is a lesson on how to set up a basic methodology and structure on how to draw big cat heads and features. Though we will be using lions as our subject matter, we will also touch on comparisons between them and bears, dogs, and domestic kitty cats. All these videos I have created are meant in helping you in your field sketching abilities. This tiger and lion drawing were done at the zoo as the animals moved around the compound. The idea is to simplify the process into basic building blocks and measurements, then adding more complicated things like the features, textures, and markings in tandem with that structure later on, as you get a handle on the basic form you've created. A couple of points first before we get started. One is I've sped up the drawing two times as fast as normal, and the second is that I've underexposed the video just a bit, so I've sacrificed the whiteness of the paper so you can see the pencil marks better as the video goes along. So I sort of start out with a basic ball and box uh, form, organicized down and make it a little bit more streamlined. You might notice I kind of laid in where the eyes are going to be and where the nose is, just as like landmarks to get started with. And then kind of pulling in that idea where the muzzle hits the ball or the back, bigger back of the cranium of the head. I also personally have a tendency to make it a little bit more blocky and a little bit more angular at first because I know that I'm going to be sort of organicizing it and sort of rounding off those sharp edges a little bit later where it's deemed necessary. But I also understand there's a lot of skull and a lot of bone underneath there and I want to make sure that I acknowledge that so it doesn't end up getting too soft and gooey and looking like a plush toy. So in this next section I'm putting a piece of tracing paper over the drawing that I'm doing right now. I'm going to show you how that skull structure, you can see it leading in from the left there, uh, influences eventually what's going to happen when it comes down to the markings, uh, the fur patterns, and even the shading that's going to go on over the top of uh, the drawing that I'm already making. So with the blue pencil you can see I'm charting out uh, the structure of that skull underneath. And I'm also not just outlining with a big heavy outline, I'm trying to accent with the line quality, keeping it a little bit lighter where it, it sort of influences the surface a little bit and then kind of hammering it on uh, some of the edges where you can really see it and even the core shadows coming up the zygomatic arch which is a cheekbone and then into the area above where the nose is uh, the nasal bone up above and where the sockets are where the eyes fit in. I find it especially important around by the teeth area because number one a lot of your animals are going to be opening up that mouth and showing up uh, all those canines underneath there and the other reason for it is is that it really influences the pad in the muzzle area and the nose. You can really see that as the photograph of the big cat emerges from over the top of the skull. It may not look like it really shows up in the photograph, but let me tell you, when you're out there in the field sketching and you're looking for those little landmarks that will tell you where certain parts of the form are or where the proportions are, it's going to come really handy in the future. Plus, by just adding that into your drawing, it makes the drawing look a lot more sophisticated and a lot more knowledgeable. Ultimately, you'll have a drawing that has a lot of strengths to it in relationship to the animal you're drawing, but also a lot more subtlety when it comes to turning corners and showing more ability to be able to edit all the information that's coming at to you and making a cohesive uh, drawing. Perhaps you'll notice that I didn't copy the skull, but instead interpreted it to make use of more of the form to enhance the sculptural part of the drawing. Now, we've lightened up the previous drawing and we'll now go back and reinforce the basic measuring and proportions before I commit to the animal's unique line and value. You can see in the diagram to the left that I kept the layout design pretty generic but proportionally correct. This allows me to have a simple prototype head to wrap my brain around and confirm the basic head that I'm drawing is as good as I move into the next features and details. This makes the whole drawing process a lot scary. Now I move on to sketching up the individual qualities in the drawing you need to add to the design to make it more unique to the creature that you are looking at. In this pass over the drawing, I just go in and build up the features and forms and let my eyes look over the lioness to see what unique individual points there are to her face and what I want to accent as I draw along. Again, I don't focus too much on details. I'm just happy to have something that looks generally like a lion at this point. And that's an important point because at this point as you're drawing, the animal's going to be moving around, you're going to be getting frustrated, you're going to be looking for landmarks, uh, trying to get the thing put together right. Uh, maybe even the lioness will turn around in the opposite direction, you'll have nothing to draw from. So you'll go back into those landmarks and the general structure of it to kind of build it up and then look for the uniqueness as it goes along. 
And frankly, if your subject just moves away, you'll be creating it out of whole cloth, just out of thin air, just to make it believable. Uh, by knowing all of these little techniques that you'll be able to do it uh, even without having your model uh, standing right in front of you. And ultimately, that'll be very satisfying because you'll create a really nice drawing and you won't get frustrated or come up against a uh, creative block. You'll just flow right through the problems. So at this point in the drawing process, I start to focus more on the individual features of the animal. That would be accents like the size of the eyes, the drop in the mouth, the age of the animal, uh, the texture of the markings, etc. I've got that process laid out in the book I wrote, and I'm now adding that to the design. So at this point, I think I'll stop talking and draw just for a little bit. Okay, now that I've got the basic head and feature structure laid out, I'm going to add value and then texture to the drawing. If you look at that chunky drawing to the left, you can see how that skull structure influences the surface form and ultimately the strength of your design. The cross contour marks move over the top of the form and around it, and you can see as, my, as I sort of cross hatch through this thing, you can see the marks like really sort of sculpt that form rather than just being uh, values. The marks move with the texture and with the way the light logic goes over the top of that form. And basically in the uh, diagram, the yellow marks and orange marks define where the light is hitting the top of the planes and the red marks are defining where the form and where the marks are floating around the form in the darkness. Okay, now we move on to the diagram to the left. That diagram demonstrates the texture and hair pattern and movement across the form of the lioness's head. The idea at this point is not to just carpet the surface of the head with hair or fur. Instead, I combine the pattern and texture of the hair with the light and the shadow patterns on the creature. Perhaps as this lesson goes along, you will notice that I edit a boatload of textures out of the lit areas at the top planes of the head. That is catching the light, though the fur may be dark. I don't leave these areas blank, but simply suggest a texture to define the direction of the form. I'm using quite a bit of artistic license to make sure the whole design is unified so the texture and shading don't overwhelm the entire portrait. Perhaps you can see the marks I laid down work in waves and sequence ripples that have a softer stroke but travel in a fluid movement. This is where the shadow and light logic are balanced with the anatomy and the line and value style that you eventually will use. When you are field sketching and having to get all this done quickly, you will have to throw out 99% of all of this information. But at that point, after practicing these concepts, your editing and drawing results will be very confident. As I might have mentioned before is that uh, you'll notice some proportional differences, but again, I'm using the photograph more as a reference, not trying to copy it. And as you go forward in your own practice, you will learn by using this information to make mistakes and learn from them and come up with your own sense of creative flow. In this next part of the video, I'm gonna be doing some comparative anatomy profiles. Again, just so you'll be able to see the general layout. Uh, and again, as you work towards different kind of animals, you'll be able to see what is different but at the same time there's a lot of uh, similar sort of aspects to each one of these creatures. So I'll be starting out with a lion, moving on to a dog, then on to a bear, and then a domestic cat. When it comes out to generally blocking out these creatures, first thing I'm doing is looking at is the basic shape of the head, right? And that comes down to sort of the slope of the upper part of the head, uh, the eye socket, that little hump that hits there, the length of the muzzle, 
and then down to like say the zygomatic arch which is right underneath the eye the position of the eye and then the general roundness or squareness of the back of the head that's the way i just turn to look at each one again very generically uh, very simple to get my wrap my head around it at first uh, rather than getting confused about all the details and that works out for any sort of dog breed right all the way from pugs with a whole different kind of shape of the head is you just simplify the heck out of it and then move on from there One important aspect that I always use to kind of keep things in line is the fact that the nose, the eyes, and the ears generally line up in a line. They sort of work all in tandem. Also look at the distance between the ears and the eyes and the length of the muzzle. Uh, you can see this in the bear that I'm laying out that I'm gonna come back a little bit later, uh, even after I've done the drawing without using a photograph and sort of just by the seat of my pants, look at it and go, well, I think the nose is a little bit too long and I end up shortening it. Now it comes down, even though I'm using photographs or reference here, I'm still sort of uh, making sure that my sort of general design of the creature uh, stays intact. That's why that even though I may look at a photograph and the length of that bear's nose may be look too long, though it may be correct, I just have something in the back of my head always makes me want to kind of question uh, what I'm doing in relationship to what it should look like and what it could look like. You can see that as I draw the uh, domestic cat here, I always kind of keep in mind that the head's like a very large ball. It has a relatively small snout in relationship to a, a big cat. And that the eyes and the ears are a lot larger than a big cat as well. Though it may have a very similar structure to it. As you can see in here, the red marks I went back in to reinforce the idea of the shape and the basic ball or boxy shape in the back of the head. And the differences in the muzzles as well. So in this last part of the lesson, I'm going to take a uh, lion and with a large mane and break that down and show you how it's put together using uh, some of the techniques and some of the ideas that we used in the previous drawings. Uh, it's definitely going to be a design again because if you notice the shape and the general layout, it's just the same as a lioness. It's just that now I keep it a little bit more angular uh, just because of the roughness that's there. And uh, I'll design literally design the mane and even do things as sort of make sure that the jawline goes in back of the muzzle. And so I keep that sort of structural overlapping form in mind and also the angularity. Perhaps you can see there's a lot of shape design involved here. And what I mean by that is, and again, I sort of take the organicness out of it. I think of it more as larger planes like a, a painter would do. And then block, block it in, make sure my design sort of set out right. And then even the mane, you'll see that rather than dealing with all of the motion of the hair and like the thousands of individual strands, I come back in and sort of give it a haircut, design it a little bit more. Again, just so I can get the idea of what I want to do with it as I put it together. Especially with a mane like this, you're not gonna end up, uh, at least I'm not, you're not gonna end up doing a lot of rendering of the hair, or certainly not even gonna be drawing the color of the hair, but you'll be working more with the idea of how the light falls on top of uh, that creature's head. So I'm adding the red marks in there just to reinforce the shape and the form of the head so it doesn't get lost when I put in the rest of the textures and the values on top of it. So as I draw it now, I'm really trying to establish more of a rhythm or flow in the lines that I'm putting down. Uh, kind of again looking at the way that that mane is going to enhance the entire design and since frame the head um, you might be able to notice that the edges of it I keep pretty fluid 
uh, and those little marks I'm putting in the cheek, I'm literally trying to take the hair and embed it into the head rather than make, have it, make it look like it's a bad toupee on top of the head. Um, at the same time, I still want to have a wild look to it, a more natural look to it. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here at first, as I'm just concerning what my dynam dynamic sketching is, and what my design is going to be. And then I'm going to go in and execute it as I feel a little bit more confident about what the results are. You can even see in this like little diagram I put up on top that uh, it's very stylized. And ev eventually what I'm going to be doing is using the flowing pattern of the hair to sort of exhibit a little bit more of the organic uh, qualities in the animal. You also might notice that I sort of bounce around a little bit on the drawing. Uh, normally by this time I probably would have gone into the face a little bit more, kind of bumped up the features, uh, but for this demo, for this lesson, it's better that you watch the fluidity and the sequence that I put the marks down for and the variety of marks I put down, whether they're very short marks, uh, whether they're long fluid marks showing maybe the main sort of going over sort of the temples a little bit more. Uh, what I'm trying to do is build up a little bit of a more of a vocabulary of marks there and make it a little bit more sophisticated rather than just drawing a bunch of spaghetti on top of the head. You might see in that uh, photograph of that wild lion from Kenya on the right uh, that the mane isn't that or well organized. It does obviously have a natural sort of look to it, a wild look to it. But at the same time, you have to organize that to complement your design uh, rather than just drawing a bunch of errant hair and wild uh, streaks all over the place. It will take away from your overall design and hurt your drawing. Again, frequently you'll be drawing this super fast and you'll be super simplifying it, so you won't have a chance to draw all of this individual hairs all over the place. You're just going to have to go for that simple shape and more for the notation and the influence of the statement of what you're drawing and the suggestion of it. Everybody knows what's on top of a lion's head. So frequently a suggestion is better than hours of rendering individual hair follicles. Having said that, having that information, that ability to render this out is really important if you have the time to do it or if you are doing a portrait of an animal that needs more of that texture and more of that believability. At this point, I move into the features and textures of the face, but usually I would combine the face with the mane. It's important to work up the whole image as one whole design, but while doing that, make sure that the details and the textures don't detract from the whole drawing. So in the last couple of minutes of this part of the demo, uh, I'm just going to go in and strengthen up uh, the smaller parts of the features, the stuff that's got a little bit more dynamicism and a little bit more individuality along with the whole design, uh, and then go in and re really reinforce the uh, values and the shadows back underneath the chin a little bit more, making sure that as I do it, that uh, the pieces don't fall apart and it's still unified into one image. Now this is really important because, well, as I said before, you're frequently going to have to do this in just literally a minute or just a couple of minutes. And so you're going to really have to know how to kind of use your marks to simplify this, but make a strong image at the same time, or at least give you enough information that you can continue on later. So as you come to an end of this part of the demo, sort of look and compare the two different references, the photograph and the drawing, and see the changes that I made to enhance what my sense of style and my sense of design is for the animal. So if you want to get this right, you're going to have to practice. This is down at the zoo in front of the cougar and just drawing, drawing after drawing, uh, angle after angle, even if you're using photo reference on it, uh, you're just going to have to sit back and really churn through these. Learning to draw that head is a really good asset in your whole sort of idea of uh, drawing weaponry that you're going to be putting together. And the fact that a good head would be very convincing. So you combine it with the anatomy and the rest of the body, it'll make a really strong statement. 
but it's also a real confidence builder. And to be able to sort of sit back and go to the local zoo and just sort of sketch up your favorite animals, it's going to be really, really super cool. And I hope you do a lot of it. And so in closing, I've written a couple of animal drawing books um, that are actually pretty good. Got a lot of anatomical information together. Uh, the information's at the top there. They're both available on Amazon.com. Um, and I hope you like the video. And please uh, like the channel. It's Gary Draws and Paints. And go back in and hit the subscription thing on it. And uh, I'll be putting more up in the future. This is just number one of a whole bunch of different ones. There's other videos on uh, drawing animals and landscape and people and even uh, vehicles. So if you get a chance, go take a look at them and feel free to share. And I thank you a lot for visiting. And adios, folks. See you later. Bye.